formal invitations seem to be a thing of the past, unless it's a big deal. State dinners, black tie awards, the Vanity Fair party after the Oscars, formal wedding invitations, you know, the kind with the little pieces of tissue paper in between the printed cards, they seem to be out of style in favor of simpler, more casual options. Events like a great dinner or a wedding banquet, a wedding feast in first century Palestine, came with quite the organizational arrangement. People would have known well the custom of the wedding feast, invitations sent out long before the date, people replying in the affirmative. The king we encounter in our story this morning goes all out for his wedding, son's wedding banquet. I bet he arranged for those asparagus wrapped in prosciutto or maybe stuffed crabbed mushrooms as hors d'oeuvres or oh, those favorite delicious bacon wrapped scallops. The best wine, lots of it, and the best band this side of the Jordan warming up and ready to go. The buttercream frosting on the cake melting in the Judean sun. You would have to be crazy not to go to this wedding event. On the day of the wedding, all was ready. The servants summoned the guests for dinner, except they didn't show up. The guests, I don't know, they must have been busy with, you know, soccer games or like their weekend getaway to the big city in place of coming to the wedding. The king sent out even yet more servants to invite ordinary citizens to the banquet. This time, the original invitees either ignore the royal summons altogether, or worse, they mistreat and kill some of the king's servants. A rather absurd reaction to a wedding invitation, don't you think? But not the greatest absurdity of this dark tale. In retaliation, the king sends troops to destroy these offenders and then issues an invitation to everyone. The festival turns into a big, big event. The good and the bad, all welcome to the party hosted by the king. All are welcome to the banquet table. But nothing about this parable is appealing, right? This is an ugly parable. It's the third in a series of not so comfortable stories in the Gospel of Matthew. In general, Matthew is, well, a little abrupt. Matthew bombards us with harsh parables that don't go down easily, like good wine at dinner. They're powerful, and they're challenging. Think of this. If there, there are only two ways to wind up on the outside of this party, one, you, regard the invita you disregard the invitation completely. Or two, you somehow imagine that an invitation that is this wide open to everyone cannot be worth very much. And so you stumble into the wedding dressed like you just came out of the gym, just in case the wedding banquet is a bore. This was the party of the century. One man came in at the gracious invitation of the king and came without the right garments, without the, white white, without the right wedding robe, and he was reprimanded and banished into the outer darkness. Because you see, this was a gracious invitation, but it was far from a casual invitation. What God requires of us is to do God's will. God wants everyone at that party, but not everybody wants to come who comes uh, not, everybody who, not everybody wants to come or knows how to behave when they get there. This story in Matthew is not at all realistic in terms of our society, right? It's a claim that only the gospel can make. This is a story about what matters to God. It's about how we welcome others and how we treat them in our midst. Because our God is a God of expansive love and radical inclusivity, we are left to hear, even in this parable, the good news that God invites all, the good and the bad. 
we are the ones who see just how far God is willing to go to make this invitation of grace. God doesn't stop with one invitation, but over and over and over again, God extends the invitation to us to join the party and to come to the table where all are welcome. So what we learn, also learn, is that God's word of love and forgiveness are more powerful than any words of punishment or hate or fear. God's invitation to this story is so broadly inclusive and utterly decisive. This kind of invitation, the one about radical hospitality, this one about spreading the table wide to welcome everyone, this invitation, well, it has to change your schedule. This invitation from God for us to be part of this banquet God has prepared with people of different traditions and different looks and different values, that invitation, what well, has to change your life. The banquet is about God's grace overflowing for the whole community. It's a metaphor about God's love and care. And because of God's invitation to that feast, we have to live in a way that opens us to share that same love and grace with others, to give up oneself for God's future kingdom story is where we're going to find Jesus. Now, if you read on in the Gospel of Matthew, you hear just how Jesus is under extreme pressure from the religious leaders who are trying to trap him. Jesus is at a critical moment in his ministry where he is trying to get God's message to any and all who would hear about the opportunity for hospitality and generosity. Jesus' path from here goes through Jerusalem to the cross. And soon, Jesus will be banished from the presence of others into outer darkness, ridiculed, rejected, and crucified. It's like Jesus in this moment is suggesting that we should show up, that we should accept an invitation, and when we do so, we should put some effort into it. So I want to share with you a true story about the kind of intentionality that I think God is up to. There was an unusual high school football game played in Grapevine, Texas in November 2008. The game was between Grapevine Faith Academy and the Gainesville State School. Faith is a private Christian school and Gainesville State is a juvenile correction facility. That year, the Gainesville State team had 14 players. They played every game on the road, and their record was 0-8. They had only scored twice. They wore outdated, used shoulder pads and helmets. The Gainesville State players were teenagers who had been convicted of crimes ranging from drugs to assault to robbery, and most of their families had disowned them. On the other hand, at the time of the game, Faith Academy had a record of 7-2. and two. They had 70 players, 11 coaches, and the latest and best equipment. Chris Hogan, the head coach for Faith Academy, knew the Gainesville team would have no fans and that it wouldn't be a contest. So he thought, what if our fans and half of our cheerleaders for one night cheered for the other team? He sent out an email to his team supporters asking them to do just that. Here's the message I want you to send, Hogan wrote. You're just as valuable as any other person on the planet, unquote. Well, some folks were so confused by this request. One player said, coach, why are we doing this? Well, Hogan said, imagine you don't have a home life and no one to love you, and no one is pulling for you. Imagine if everyone pretty much had given up on you. And now imagine how it would feel and mean to you for hundreds of people to suddenly believe in you." Unquote. 
On the night of the game, the Gainesville State players took the field, and there was a banner that the cheerleaders held that they could crash through. The visitor stands were full. The cheerleaders were leading cheers for them. The fans were calling them by name. Isaiah, the quarterback and middle linebacker, said, I never in my life thought I would hear parents cheering to tackle and hit their own kid. Most of the time, when we come out, people are afraid of us. You can see it in their eyes, but these people are yelling for us, and they knew our names. Well, Faith Academy easily won that game, and the game, after the game, the two teams gathered at the 50-yard line to pray. That's when Isaiah, the quarterback, surprised everyone when he asked if he could pray. He prays this. Lord, I don't know what just happened, so I don't know how or who to say thank you to. But I never knew there were so many people in the world who cared about us. Amen. On the way back to the bus, under guard, each one of the players was handed a hamburger and fries and a Coke, some candy, a Bible, and an encouraging letter from one of the Faith Academy players. Before the bus left, the Gainesville coach found Coach Hogan and said, you'll never know what your people did for these kids tonight. You will never, ever know. What Faith Academy did took planning and work and intentionality and courage. Who knows? what got started that night with the invitation to be part of something different, part of God's radical hospitality. So the story of that game and the story about the banquet have me wondering about God's story for us. How do we respond faithfully to God and God's invitation for our own lives? Who are we called to be as a church to reach out to those who have felt excluded how do we respond to the challenges of welcoming all people into the life of this congregation? And where do we fall short on our care and concern for others? Which brings me to the way that we respond with our thankfulness to God's gracious invitation. As the king opened the table wide for the guests, so too does God spread the table wide for us. These stories show us what really matters to God. God wants us all around the table, keeping in mind that God is generous to us, generous beyond our imagining, generous in granting us life and showering us with love and grace and forgiveness and salvation and meaning and purpose. God is so generous but I venture to say God's a little greedy, too, in a good way. God wants all of us. There is no corner of our lives that God doesn't want to be a part of. That is good news. Because then we get God's comfort and wisdom and guidance in every part of our lives. But God's presence comes with a string or two attached. We are responsible to God for how we live every aspect of our lives. To me, that's what stewardship is all about. It's not about the 10% of our income that we may or may not give away. It is about the 100%, the totality of our lives, whether we live that life in obedience to God. But we're at the beginning of our annual campaign, and I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about your intentional covenant and commitment to First Congregational Church. It's been a practice in the Christian church since its very beginning that members of a faith community share some of their resources to support the church and its mission. Every church member and friend is asked to contribute their gifts. So this morning, I invite each and every one of you to be prayerful, 
to make an intentional commitment to sustain and grow the mission and ministry of First Church with your gift of time, energy, and money. As to what this commitment is, well, that's up to you and God. God knows what you're up against. God knows how busy you are. God knows about the downturn in our economy and this global pandemic that we're fighting. God knows that some of you are out of work or underemployed or fearful of losing a job. God knows that you have kids that need clothes and braces and books. God knows how much college costs these days. God knows that some of you are on fixed incomes. And God knows that there are other organizations out there that have captured your heart and that you need to give time and money to. God also knows if you are in a position to give more than you have before or to give for the very first time. God knows all that stuff. The only one that you need to please in making a pledge commitment is God. This God knowing everything can be a mixed bag. Keep in mind that God also knows other things as well. God knows how much stuff we have, how much money we make, how much we spend on ourselves and how much we give away. God knows how much money you spent last year eating out before the pandemic. God knows the total of my yearly satellite television bill. And again, the one you need to please with that decision is God. So when it comes to your pledge commitment, God wants you to make a prayerful and thoughtful faith-led decision that reflects the fullness of your life. And then God wants you to apply that attitude to every other economic decision that you make. So don't be fooled. When you figure out what you're going to pledge for the coming year, you're not done wrestling with money and faith. You're never really done wrestling with issues of money and your faith. Maybe that's the way God wants it. Because God's not content with 10% of our lives. As the table is opened wide at that banquet, God wants all of us around it. God wants 100% of our lives committed to God. And what do you do to return our thanks to a God that is so generous. What do you do and what do you owe to God who invites you to the table? I think we owe God everything. Absolutely everything. Amen.